This podcast is brought to you by Mapper Forward's new Patreon community, the Global Coffee Think Tank. Check the show notes or head to patreon.com forward slash Mapper Forward to find out how you can become a member today. Welcome to the Daily Coffee Pro by Map It Forward, friends. We are sadly at our last episode with Shahan. Shahan, this has been a fantastic series. I really appreciate the quality and the depth of the, the discussion. Super easy to talk to you, and I hope that this means that you'll come back again. Um, now, in this conversation, we're going to talk about where coffee research is headed into the future. Right now in our industry, we have a lot of very interesting let's say science happening uh, throughout the entire supply chain. Things have changed rather rapidly during the pandemic when it comes to processing methods at origin. And on the other end of the spectrum with regards to consumer habits and consuming consumer behavior, uh, science has really influenced the impact of the way that consumers brew at home versus uh, in the cafe. So science is really influencing things across the value chain. When it yeah. comes to coffee Absolutely. research into the future, where do you see it going? Yes. The first thing I have to say is that we are absolutely at the beginning of coffee research, you know? Awesome. And um, I remember when I gave talks 10, 10, 15 years ago about coffee, I'm coming from the nanotechnology field, mm-hmm. you know, working on alloys and metals. And um, and I had the impression we know much more about the supernova that is 10,000 <laughs> light years away from us than about the coffee we drink. Every you know? day. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, we know so much about the interior of an atom and how the composition, and we know so little about the coffee that we drink every day. So really, science can go so much further out there, Mm. you know? And there has always been, of course, a little bit uh, reluctance to go to complex systems. So the science in the past has always tried to work on simple systems to Mm -hmm. master everything. Whereas coffee, of course, is a complex system. But the science of complex system had improved incredibly. There is really a whole new field of science that is going to increasingly complex method and developing methodologies to master complexity in a way, you know? Mm-hmm. And coffee is an ultimately complex system, but you can do science if you are a well-educated scientist. And if you know the techniques to master it, which is at the base math, you know, science is mm-hmm. math. If you don't understand numbers and measurements, you're not a scientist in a simple, when I say, you know, just by smelling, you have to put things in numbers. You have to put things in graphs. That's where science starts. You have to be good in math and uh, and not only measuring, but then finding the information in the measurements, Mm -hmm. which is often modeling and models and hypothesis building. So a scientist, is not only measuring and putting uh, points on a graph. This is the measurements. The information is actually then in the analysis, in the presentation. So uh, the science, as it is done in nanotechnology, in cancer science, is at a, such a different level that we can say at the coffee, we are just really scratching the surface. So the science, the quality of the scientist has a huge amount that you can, we are really just, um, going towards the low hanging fruits right at the moment, you know, that's how I see it. Mm -hmm. So coffee is so much more complex. There's so much that we can discover. Now, the, the special thing with coffee is that it is, of course, the humans are so deeply involved, you know, it is not only because we want to sell catalysts or to make uh, planes that fly better, you know, things like that. We have all ways to have to bring in the human being. Mm -hmm. So I believe the first and the biggest element that we would have to do in the future is is consumer science. We have to improve our technologies and our our volume of science uh, in, in consumer science. Understanding the consumer, why he drinks coffee, how he drinks coffee, and what he likes. So the consumer science aspect is, is, I would say, the most neglected element right now in the mm. coffee business, which, um, because that's the driver of our business, you know, 
And if we don't understand what is pulling everything, we do not know how to apply the science to make it work for the consumer. So I think consumer science is one thing that we should be doing. The second element is now, of course, all the, the, the crisis that we have, I would call that like with uh, the pests and diseases, yeah. uh, climate change and sustainability issues, people leaving the farms to go into cities. So we have on the production side and uh, really urgent problems to solve mm -hmm. has to do with also the, uh, the uh, asymmetry of information along the value chain. Now, mm -hmm. the people who are at the beginning, they, they know so little about, they have so little information that they cannot make um, like good Informed. judgments about how yeah. to inform decisions. Whereas the people at the end, they are full of information, you know, and when they trade, when they buy their coffee. And so, so there's a huge asymmetry information, which puts the people at the beginning of the value chain at the hugest advantage. Mm -hmm. They are, and, um, and so if we don't have good coffee, we are not going to satisfy the consumer. So we, there's, uh, the whole trade has to be also rethought a little bit how we trade and how we create more equitable value chain so there are some ethical problems to be solved as well as very practical problem about the threats to the coffee plantations from climate yeah. change to uh, and so that's why we think about new species new varieties that are possibly more resistant mm -hmm. uh, arabica is a very labile plant you know mm -hmm. uh, so so i think research um, will go a lot towards um, uh, making the beginning of the value chain more robust, more solid, uh, and more informed about the rest of the value chain. And that will require also not only agronomy and, um, um, and the, the cultivation technology, farm management, it will also has to do with educating the farmers or the people at the beginning of the value chain. Uh, education will become a very important part and now in terms of research, as I said, we are at the beginning. There are so many tools that we can bring in, uh, real hard science, <laughs> I call it, you know. Yep. And uh, But we always have not to forget that the reference is, of course, a consumer experience. And that is actually what I, in, in my, for me personally, that's what brought me initially into coffee. It is the complexity. Mm -hmm. As a scientist, I found that if you work on coffee, you can work on anything because it's so complex. If you master coffee, you master everything. Yeah. You know, there's nothing, it's more complex. It has human element. It has agronomy, biology, biotechnology, fermentation, physics. rose, physics, material science, everything is in there. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that's what we're doing in the coffee excel set. We are trying to cover all aspects in a holistic approach with the objective to deliver an experience and to master the experience in the cup. And, um, and to modulate experience in the cup in a controlled way. Mm -hmm. So I think that we are at the beginning and every, every big scientific field will able to contribute. So we don't have to discover material science in the grinding. It's all there. We just have to understand how we, we don't have to do biotechnology and discover. Biotechnology is a field totally mature. We just have to be educate Adapted. enough to integrate the knowledge into our field. Mm -hmm. So we are actually, uh, we are in the good position that we can, uh, we can profit from a huge amount of science that was done in a different field, but we basically, we have to translate it into our field and adapt it to our field. So I think that's the challenge initially for the coffee scientist is to, to be able to understand the huge progress done in many other fields and to integrate into our field and make advancement before we create really a very specific coffee research, you know, which we do, but uh, both is important. So coffee research at the beginning, let's profit from what people know already, yeah. integrate and translate into our coffee field and uh, understand that there is a gravitational force, which is the consumer. So we're not doing lach pour lach. We're not doing science just because it's so nice. We have always to, Re, uh, to put in relevance to the impact it has on the consumer experience. Yeah, and uh, and so 
these are the challenges we, we're facing and we have to stay always in very close connection to the coffee community, to the coffee consumer. So it is not uh, something that we do at the university because otherwise we will then start to drift away. You know, we need a gravitational force that yeah. puts us back where we have to go at. So we are working a gravitational force of people who consume it and, uh, and that will orient our research. So it's not, we do not do basic research, we really do applied research. Right. I want to ask a specific question with regards to the future of science, and that is around testing. Because right now, uh, you know, if we go back to our water example that we spoke about in the first episode, there's such yeah. a misconception about what correct testing is and what can be tested and what can't be tested. You've been quoted before uh, in blog articles and things like that about you've tested this and you've tested that and you've decided that certain things were real um, and definitive. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah. Yes. Go ahead. I think that before you do research, you have to define uh, objective. Mm -hmm. You know, in, mm -hmm. in science, we call it a hypothesis testing. Mm -hmm. You know, you develop a hypothesis and... Based on that hypothesis, you design an experimental plan. Mm -hmm. And at the end, you have, you have an answer to your hypothesis. Mm -hmm. So for example, total house has an impact on, on the sensory profile. So then you do an experimental plan where you vary the total hardness. And at the end, you come to a result how that affects the sensory profile. Right. So you have, you have to start with a simple hypothesis that people understand. This is a little bit also what we are challenged with. If we talk with people who are not scientists, we have to formulate our hypothesis in a way that people understand it. But every research starts with an objective, which is in, in fact a hypothesis that we claim, you know, or mm -hmm. a, a question that we ask. And then we have to develop an experimental plan that is that really addresses that question. So sometimes you see things, somebody ask a question. And they have an experimental plan that is not really addressing that question. Right. And at the end, they don't even try to answer the question they initially ask. You know. So, and then, so you really that just sounds like scientist, bad science. <laughs> yeah, you have to be rigorous. If you ask a question, your experimental plan has to be such that it really gives an answer to the question. And then at the <laughs> end, you cannot just walk away. You have to confront your hypothesis. Did you have? Do you have an answer to your hypothesis? What is it? So basically, we. Then some people will will say, well, your hypothesis is not interesting or is not relevant. But then we have, before we do uh, start the research, we have to spend time to ask the right questions. Right. And if we write the right, if we ask the right questions, which we have to do together with people, not alone, then as a scientist, we can go into our lab and then develop an experimental plan, how to address it. That's something we can often do alone, you know. But once we have a clear question, a clear hypothesis, we can then develop an experimental uh, design, experimental plan, which uh, we believe is, is the, is the, will help us to give an answer. In science, you have always this issue that we call these drifting objectives, you know? So you start yes. a project and then people start to change their objectives and you are working on experimental plan that ask, uh, gave an answer to the original question. And somehow you realize that the people who asked the original question are not interested anymore. They change their questions, you know? Right. That's why you have to write down these questions. You know, this hypothesis has to through. be basically nearly as a contract, you know? Yep. So what we're doing right now, because a scientist takes time. And then sometimes you realize that the, that the objective is not valid. Of course, then you can say, okay, let's stop the research. But that's why it's so important to ask the right questions. So and I... So, I want, yeah. I want to use a specific example here that kind of ties together everything that we've spoken about in all of these five episodes, the objectivity and subjectivity together with the future of where science is going, as well as what good coffee is and good coffee isn't, mm -hmm. and kind of uh, this 
uneven distribution of power through the supply chain that you mentioned earlier in this episode. So infused coffees is a really great, and in, in inverted commas, infused coffees is a really great kind of emerging, ambiguous kind of field yeah. in coffee, right? Yes. On on one side of the spectrum, this is something that seems to be uh, working very well for producers. Producers yes. are getting paid really great money for uh, very interesting new processing methods. Yes. But then we look at competition and people are saying that this is really throwing a spanner into the works with regards to the uh, the ability of judges to be able to judge these coffees. Where yes. does, does the future of science, first of all, let me start, ca- uh, ask you a question. Can science test, like just run a lab test and be able to say, this is an infused coffee or it's not an infused coffee when it comes to like, let's say a a coffee that tastes like a lot like pineapple or mango. Can science turn around and say this was an infused coffee or not? Okay. So the answer that I should give is yes, we can do it. You know, I should say that. Uh, And I'd like to say that um, because I want, for people who who really do infuse coffee but don't say it or not transparent, that right. they believe that if they do that, we can show that. But so so my answer is yes, we can do it. So if you say if you do it and you don't be transparent, we will be able to see it. You know, so be careful. Um, now but... the reality <laughs> reality and uh, the reality is I'm not sure. I don't want to say we're not able. I'm not sure because we are actually working. You know, there's this coffee called, I don't want to give the El Diamante, you know, which has been in the discussion. We tested that and we just finished the research and we are actually taking coffees from those that we, we're trying to take coffees where we don't know, but also from coffees that we are absolutely sure they have not been infused, but that have crazy flavors, you know, (laughs) crazy flavors. And we are trying to find out what, where is this crazy flavor coming from? And can we prove that it was not infused? You know, mm-hmm. so that's the approach we're taking. And so the, so if you have like a, a, a coffee that has a, a very specific fruity flavor of a strawberry or of pineapple, you know, or, or others, you know, there are some typical notes that people have created and I know these people, I spoke with people and they say it's not infused, Mm -hmm. but it's really crazy. So what we do is we do a very detailed chemical analysis by techniques that we call gas chromatography or also GC sniffing, you know, where we sniff and we try to find the origin of this strawberry flavor, which Mm -hmm. molecule are actually responsible in this product that makes us smell a strawberry flavor. Now, strawberry, we also know what strawberry is, and we know what the key flavor compounds of strawberry are. Now, if we see a pattern that is very different, you know, so the key flavor compounds of strawberry are not there, but other compounds which have a fruity strawberry note, a berry type of note, which makes that coffee smell strawberry, but the key flavor compound of strawberry is not there, then we can say this cannot be a strawberry added, you know? This is really a crazy process that generates flavor compounds, which are not the signature of strawberry, but which are themselves giving this strawberry impression. So we look at the key flavor compounds of that specific fruits and at the relative concentrations. And if the, if the profile is very different, then we can say it's not infused. Now, if we find exactly the profile, you know, and if we find even some aroma compounds that are not fine in coffee, and it is there, you know, cinnamon or things like that, then we can say, yes, this is infused. But then we're coming into a field where our judgment is not enough. We have to express that with statistical probabilities. You know, when you go into competition athleticism and you use uh, drugs that are not allowed, 
yep. it's not enough to show that they have that in the blood. You have to show the probability to have that in your blood is smaller than 0.01%. Otherwise, you cannot, you're not going to accuse somebody of cheating because your judgment is then saying this person is cheating. But we do not know whether it's possible. Right now, in our world of coffee, to find a cinnamon compound, a cinnamon flavor cup typical, is not something we have seen. It is not something we have seen. But we don't want to judge uh, right now um, because perhaps fermentation can get that. But we have like very strong feeling. Generally, if somebody, somebody has a coffee that smells like strawberry cinnamon and we find compounds that have that flavor but are not the key flavor compound of cinnamon or strawberry or, or pineapple, then we are quite sure it's not infused. Right. So, and then we can, but if somebody has a typical compound to accuse somebody of infused, of infused coffee is something that I, uh, I think that's much more difficult, but to say it's not infused, even if it smells like that, that I think we're quite, quite strong at. And I think this is what's going to play an interesting role in the future of science in coffee. And I think we're in a dangerous place right now whereby we haven't done enough science to be able to have these kinds of, uh, you know, people talking about this kind of stuff on social media when they're, they're not a coffee scientist. And yeah. coffee science isn't at the place where it can definitively say one thing or the other. People coming out and having opinions like this could destroy the economics of a whole region in a at an origin country, which can get very dangerous, yeah. right? Yes. Yeah, exactly. This discussion is, of course, uh, important to have because it's, of course, yeah. not fair to compete with infused coffees. Right. It's not, it's not fair. So you have to, to have rules, but then you expect from the competitors to be transparent and fair uh, and... Um, and now we're at the phase where science only, we started only recently to this research. Right. What we should be able is that competitors submit their coffees, perhaps uh, we even test them, you know, or, or they should know that if they did, they did infuse, science will be able to prove it, but it should be proven by a scientific approach. And if we don't know, we would never accuse anybody of infused, um, but, the transparency is the important thing. I don't have anything against people playing around, you know, uh, to add aromas. That's good, you know. People like you do uh, aromatized coffee, but it must be done in a transparent way. And uh, if if the farmer said it's not infused, then I think that we have to trust the farmer. Um, mm -hmm. But it's an it's an issue that it's important to talk about it. Yep. And um, and so. Discussion was was started a year ago. I know I know quite um, quite well because I'm also citing these articles. You know, I'm and yeah. I really also want to avoid people coming with infused coffees to competitions. I would like to say on that that I think that when we say it's unfair to compete with uh, with infused coffees, uh, competition in barista competitions and Brewers' Cup competitions is inherently unfair on a lot of levels. You know, it's it's unfair yes. because it's very expensive to compete, which means that it excludes a lot of people from the ability to compete. Yes. And yes. so it, it is an elitist endeavour that favours a few people in the industry who can afford to participate in this race so for yeah. a lot of reasons uh i think the least of them being the infused coffees thing uh is is unfair um but i take your mm -hmm. point because I, I at the end of the day if a producer is saying that this is not an infused coffee we should believe the producer Mm -hmm. at, at, yeah. Because until science is at a point where it can say, I'm going to take this sample and I'm going to test it and I can tell you if there are any additives in this coffee, I don't think that we really have the right mm -hmm. uh, to 
to pass judgment. Nobody has the right in the industry to go out and, and grab a megaphone and say, well, I'm going to hijack the narrative and decide that even though this producer said that this coffee wasn't infused, I'm going to decide that this coffee uh, was most likely yes. infused. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the other part to that is that, we have such a far way to go that perhaps the best way to approach competition is to give every barista the same coffee. Yes, I agree. That, I agree on that. I agree, uh, which is the compulsory, you know, and uh, the compulsory in the filter coffee era. So that's yeah. actually a, a good approach. And um, I, I, I'm sure this is uh, reflected in the industry uh, because in fact, and that's now very personal opinion, is the barista really the person who has who has to spend months in the origin countries to find the right origin and no. coffee or is he should he focus on the techniques of the barista so it's what we have we have put too much now importance on var var species and varieties and post harvest processing on the shoulder of the barista and uh, and that should be like another competition you know Yep. And the barista should be the the person who who understands the transformations, you know, from the whether you want to integrate the roasting in it or not, or it should be roasted. I don't know, but uh, this is also part of you want to ask the barista to be also responsible for the roasting because they do that as well, you know. Right. They roast their profile. So, do you want to give the barista a green coffee and they can already play with the roasting, or it's even the roasted? I think that's a legitimate question to ask for the future of the Barista Championship. And then you don't have these questions anymore. Shahan, I really, really hope that you come back and have another conversation with me on this podcast. This has been a joy. This has been one of my favorite conversations this year, I have to tell you. Um, <laughs> what I'm I... excited about is the future of our industry because you are in it. So thank you yeah. for what you're doing, for driving progress and innovation in our industry and science. Thank you a lot, Lee. And I enjoyed a lot myself to talk about it because thank it's you. my life, you know, coffee. And uh, I look forward to to meeting you at a different, you know, e-meeting or personally meeting. Mice. Let's hope to catch up at mice. Exactly. Inshallah. Um, Inshallah. Where, where is the best place for people to connect with you? Is it LinkedIn? Um, uh, LinkedIn, LinkedIn is a good possibility. Yeah. Uh, email is, is in fact, you know, I, my problem is that there are so many channels today, you know, people yeah. come for WhatsApp, <laughs> the other one about Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook. <laughs> At the end, I remember that somebody asked me something. I just don't know which channel it was. Okay. And, uh, and so, uh, if I could funnel everything through the email, it's the best Perfect. for me. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> great. So we'll put, um, I'm going to put your LinkedIn Pro, uh, your LinkedIn That's good. thing as That's well good, as your you know. email address. Yeah, and people can get in contact with you there. Uh, Shahan, this was wonderful. Thank you. And I will see you at MICE. Thank Perfect. you. See you there. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bye. Peace, love and peanut butter, everybody. Have an amazing rest of your day. Thanks, friends. If you enjoyed this video, here's what you should check out next. Consider supporting Mapper Forward on Patreon and be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell before you leave.